Father, again this morning we come before you knowing that uh, we have indeed been called into the presence of a holy God. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the past week. And Lord, as we look forward to what lies ahead, Lord, for the blessings we know that you have in store for us this coming week. Thank you, Lord, for the uh, change in the weather. Lord, that uh, from last week to this week, Lord, that we're certainly much more comfortable than we were. And yet, Lord, uh, you allowed us to worship together, and we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for the uh, opportunity to open our doors once again and to worship together as a congregation. Lord, we know that we're, we're spread out over four services, but Lord, uh, we thank you that we can spend time together as believers. Lord, you've called us to, to worship together and to lift one another up. And so for that, we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of this morning as we're going to uh, look to your word. Lord, teach us uh, new ways, and uh, not only new ways, but uh, different ways to honor you, to praise your name. We thank you for little Addie and, Lord, for their mom and, or her mom and dad and grandma and grandpa being here. And, Lord, for the blessing that we're going to enjoy together with him in this service. So for all these things, Lord, we give you thanks, but especially, Lord, for the blessing of eternal life that you have given us by trusting in you. So for these things, Lord, we give you thanks. Continue to bless as we worship together. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. Well, good morning. We want to welcome you once again to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. We're glad to see so many smiling faces this morning, and uh, it's good that you're here bright and early. Hey, at least the sun is coming up earlier. That always helps me to get here earlier when the sun is already up. That's a good thing for my heart. When I have to drive somewhere and it's still dark out, that just makes it so much worse. But the sun is up, it's shining, it's beautiful. Like Ernie prayed, it's warmer, and that is something that we can be grateful for. We have a few announcements we want to make sure that you know as uh, we get started with our service today. I uh, just want to remind you of some of the, the precautions or regulations that are in place uh, due to COVID. Um, we have hand sanitizer at all the entrances as you come in. Uh, we do ask that you stay at least six or four, I mean, six feet or four chairs apart from each other uh, when you're sitting here. Um, other than that, if you unless you're part of the same family unit that's fine if you live in the same house you're okay uh, if you head down to the washrooms uh, just make sure you use the wipes that are in there wipe down all the surfaces that you touched throw it in the bin on the way out uh, that should be good um, we have also been advertising some books to you uh, that are we have just ordered and then we're offering that you can buy uh, the purchase price that we have for you is not something that we're making money off of. We haven't marked them up 300% to make a profit. Uh, it just covers the shipping cost and the cost of the book itself. And so I believe there are three out on the table there. Uh, one of them is The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer, uh, a great book to read. It's just a short, small one, uh, but very powerful. Give that one a try. Another shorter one is Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Uh, you can pick that one up. It's by a, an apologist and uh, a good little read, just 60 pages long. And then the third one that Pastor Dan just put out there this week is a book called The Insanity of God. It's not implying that God is insane, but it's implying that sometimes we don't understand how God works or chooses to work in our world. Uh, it's the story of a man who's traveled to many persecuted countries and just seen uh, the believers there and their stories and their experiences and then has written them down that you can enjoy. So that one's a little longer, but it's in story form. It's a great way to uh, read and be challenged. I think it even especially speaks to us because a lot of us are seeing a rising tide of uh, persecution in North America, but it opens our eyes to what Real persecution is what we might be in store for, but even what our brothers and sisters are experiencing around the world and uh, how God still works and, and the church still thrives so often uh, in those situations. So it's a, a good, encouraging read. Uh, the Tozer one and the Insanity of God are both $10 if you want to buy one. And then the Where is God in a Coronavirus World is only $5. Uh, so let us know if you'd like to get one of those or two of those or three of those. Uh, you probably don't need four out of those three, but that's okay. And uh, 
we will either take your money or you can come in throughout the week and drop it off at the church office and uh, we'd love to give you some good things to read. Uh, we want to say thank you to those who have showed up to help out with sound and PowerPoint. We have two new faces there this week, you'll already notice, and there are a few other new faces in some other services. If you still want to volunteer in those roles, that's great. Uh, we'd love to have more people help out with that so that we can not force our poor people to do it every week, but that they can maybe rotate on and off on weeks. That's just fine. If you want to serve in those areas, let us know. We'll train you up. You can ask those guys this morning how good a teacher I am, and that may help or hinder you in your volunteering. I don't know. Uh, but I think that it's going all right. Uh, we want to make sure that you still know uh, that our midweek services, or studies, I mean, are still going. Uh, those are still online, and we did confirm that. They'll be online for now at this point uh, and going forward until the regulations do change again. So the Tuesday morning Bible study will still be on Zoom. That's at 10.30 going through the Book of Romans. Friday morning prayer meeting will still be on Zoom. That's at 8 o'clock. And then Friday evening, small group study at 7.30, I think? 7. Uh, Friday evening, the study, uh, that small group, will be online as well on Zoom. So if you want to join those things, let us know. We can send you links, and that's great. Uh, we are thankful that we are able to be open. And uh, one other thing that we need to make sure that you know of, we have a lot of announcements this morning. We'll uh, try and pare them down in future weeks, but we want to make sure you know everything. For the members of this church, uh, we're calling a special business meeting. Uh, this isn't our annual meeting. We'll still have that at some point, but a special business meeting to approve the budget for this year, to approve uh, just some changes that are happening within the missions budget. The money isn't changing. The amount of money isn't changing, but who it's going to is changing a little bit. Uh, and so that is going to be happening on March 7th at 7 o'clock p.m., and it's going to be happening on Zoom. We're going to try a very unique thing. Uh, as Jerry Hildebrand, our moderator, sent out, he said this is going to be one of the most unique meetings we've ever had in Faith Fellowship history. And so if you need help getting onto Zoom, we'll be sending out a letter that just outlines exactly what that meeting is going to be, uh, as well as a, a link that you'll be able to click on so that you can join us online on March 7th at 7 p.m. for our special business meeting. We look forward to uh, how that will all come together. Yes, our scripture reading this morning will come from 2 Peter chapter 2, and we'll do verses 1 to 12 once again. We're reflecting on this passage. We've had a couple messages in it already. Now we come to the final couple verses, and uh, we'll just read 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 12. Oh, 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 12. 1 Peter 2. There we go. I don't know. At least I did. I don't know if you did too. <laughs> 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 12. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
All right, well, I've entitled this message in these two verses in, in 1 Peter, chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12, uh, live an honorable life. Uh, we need to adhere to some things. We need to abstain from some things. The great apologist, uh, Christian apologist, Wilbur M. Smith, uh, died just a few years ago, well, in 70, 1976. He wrote uh, at the end of World War II that the world has opposed Christianity ever since Jesus' day, and believers should not expect things to be different today. He wrote, at first, one would think that a religion which exalts and seeks to follow the only perfect and righteous man who ever lived on this earth, who never harmed anyone, whose words delivered from superstition and fear, whose works redeemed from pain and demons and death and hunger, whose life was as great a great shaft of life, light shot into the murky darkness of the Roman world, one would have thought the one who died because he loved us and who always sought to bring men into communion with God to bestow upon them eternal life and a home in heaven, one would have thought that such a character and the religion which his life and work on earth established would have been welcomed with open arms, that the, moment, the first moment it was announced. And it would, by his very message and the good works which flowed from it and the hope which established it, never know opposition or attack or denunciation except from the demons of hell and Satan who was a liar and murderer from the beginning. But such has not been its history. In fact, the New Testament itself, from the records of the birth of our Lord down to the end of St. John's vision of the era of anarchy and persecution to come, testifies in the most startling way to the fact that Christ himself was most viciously and constantly attacked, that his apostles suffered the same opposition, and that it was predicted by those very apostles that Christianity would continue to suffer down to the end of this very age. Has anything changed from the beginning? Jesus said, if they persecuted you, they will, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. <clears throat> Alexander McLaren in the 19th century, a Scottish preacher said, and I won't do it with a Scottish brogue, but the world takes its notions of God most of all from the people who say that they belong to God's family. They read us a great deal more than they read the Bible. They see us. They only hear about Jesus Christ. Sometimes I wish I was a Scottish preacher. <laughs> Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so Peter in this section for us this morning says essentially the same thing, that in spite of the troubles and persecutions, misunderstandings towards us that might come, we must determine to live honorable lives. It's the single most effective way for making the gospel attractive and believable to a skeptical world audience wanting the truth but ready to pounce on any single lie or misstep. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 stand as a threshold or a gateway in one sense to understanding the rest of the epistle that, that Peter writes. It's where the theological rubber meets the experiential road of life. These two verses are an introduction to the section that will teach us about how we're supposed to respond to the government and its authority. And that should be an interesting message. You should be here next week. And then it leads us into understanding what kind of relationship that we, ha we should have between employers and employees. It leads us in chapter 3 into the relationship that we should have in our marriage and so on. It, it, we want to enter into a fuller understanding, as Peter says at the end of this letter, into what it means to stand firm in the grace of God, 1 Peter 5.12. And so Peter gives us a simple formula this morning, a two-word <clears throat> summarization of the main thrust of these two verses. And he says it's a question of what is required of us. How are we to be citizens in this world? Last week we looked at why we didn't fit in this world. But this week we are here and we need to know how to rightly live. Not just <clears throat> for now, but how do we anticipate the blessings that are to come. So two words. Verse 11 speaks to us about what we need to abstain from. And verse 12 talks about what we need to adhere to. We must refrain from some things and we must give ourselves to other things. There's a, a keep away from kind of exhortation in verse 11, and there's a keep attached to encouragement in verse 12. <clears throat> and as David Helms writes, one of the authors and pastors I read, in the end, true and gracious Christian living means that we will become men and women who are known by being this 
and not that kind of people. So in verse 11, again, Peter's reminding them that they have been born again to a living hope, that they have an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. They are the people of God. They are the folks that will inherit in heaven. But how do we live now? As beloved of God, people who had not been part of God's blessings, but now have received his mercy. People who had been born into darkness, but now have entered into his marvelous light. There's, there's a hymn that we sing, and I, and I can't remember the whole thing, but I remember the one line, and oh, how... Uh, and, and oh, what joy has filled my soul. Do you remember what hymn that is? Yes, I did the same thing. I just <laughs> but, but there's a change in our perspective, a change in our heart because of our salvation. And so Peter, in, in referring to them and, and uh, uh, addressing them as the beloved who are now object of God's immeasurable love, tells them now we need to, he urges them to recognize the responsibilities that they have to live this new life. Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, therefore by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice based on all the mercies of God, all that God has done for us. And that would be a sermon that would not end <laughs> in terms of what God has done for us. I'm not preaching that one this morning. But it's a sermon that would never end because all that God does, all that God continues to do, all that God will do for us is, based, is the basis, in a sense, for us responding to his grace and mercy in our own lives. So Peter says basically the same thing in verse 11. He says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh that war against your soul. So this morning, that's the first thing we need to remember is we need to abstain from the passions of the flesh, verse 11. To properly live in this world and to please God, we need to demonstrate that we recognize the, the actuality and the reality of our new life in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, old things have passed away, behold, all things are becoming new. We must refrain from acting upon the impulses and desires of the flesh. Peter's already admonished them in the first chapter as obedient children, chapter one, verses 14 and 15 not to be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but rather be holy in your conduct as he who has called you is holy. He lists a number of those passions in chapter 2, verse 1. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. And there are some things that, that Paul says we just need to put away. When you wear clothes too often and too long, what happens to them? They stink, they smell, they get dirty. There's a part of our life that was like that before we knew Christ and Paul is telling us and Peter is telling us to put that kind of stuff away from us. We have to abstain from going back into that kind of lifestyle and that kind of thinking. <clears throat> Helms writes again, these are the things a person in Christ puts away. These are the vices from which we abstain. These are the attitudes, actions, and way of life in which, in which we once walked. They speak of the season of life when we were tethered to this world without God's indwelling power to resist. So there are kinds of, these are kinds of activities and pursuits that those without Christ indulge in. Not everybody and not all the time, but they're characteristic of those who do not know the Lord. And if Peter were alive today, I asked myself, what would he say to the church of the 21st century? Well, I think he'd say the same sort of thing. Because the word of God is still speaking to us today and there are still things that we need to abstain from. James 2 would speak to us today in a similar fashion. And if you have your Bibles just for a moment, turn over to James chapter 4 and follow as I read a couple of verses here. From The whole section of James chapter 4 verses 1 through 10 is important, but let me read the first five verses. James chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war, where? Within you? You want what you don't have, and you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, and you can't get it, so you fight and war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure, you adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world and make yourself an enemy of God, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And then I, I, it just sort of hit me when I was putting this message together. Verse 5. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? The scriptures say God is passionate. 
that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And I have to, I have to read that a couple of times, that God is passionate, that the spirit of God which he has put within us would be found faithful to him. That means Peter is saying, as James is saying, and as other writers in Scripture are saying, that we need to be serious about what God says we need to abstain from so that we will not grieve the Spirit, so we, we will not f- uh, forbid or, or, or uh, prohibit the Spirit of God from doing his work in our life. We must abstain from allowing our tongues to wag widely and wildly. Instead, we need to put a bridle on them, James says. Rein them in. So when the opportunity or activity of gossip comes up or slander or evil speaking, we must abstain from participating. It's just that simple. We must abstain from seeking revenge and vengeance of all kinds of evil deeds, even just to try to regain an advantage that we might sense in ourselves that we have lost in a situation. We must stay away, as Proverbs said, from those who would entice us to join with them to ambush the innocent without reason or to fill our houses with plunder or ill-gotten game. For example, from using God's money in in gambling or in lotteries or buying business deals that are shady at best or taking advantage of someone who has a lack of knowledge or understanding of a particular prophet just to make a deal. We've got to stay away from those things. And we must remember from whence we came where we were before Christ and where we are now with Christ. And we need to live a renewed, with a renewed mind, a disciplined tongue, and a controlled body. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But, but why abstain? What reason is given for such an exhortation? Peter goes on to give us two motivations. He says, because first of all, you're sojourners and exiles. You're aliens here on earth. This is not our home. Peter, or Paul reminded the church at Philippians, Philippians, 3, 20, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, that our citizenship is where? In Canada? <clears throat> yeah, but our citizenship is in heaven. Isn't that better? Our citizenship is in heaven from where we wait, await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are truly not members of this society. We don't fit into this world as we talked about last week. That's because of who we are and where we are going. We are not at home in this world, but we are heading home. We're on our way. Hebrews 13 verse 14 says, For we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. And so if this is not our home, we shouldn't become attached to the things that are are, uh, attributed to this home or that are connected to this home, the lusts of this world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 through 17 uh, in- encourages us to avoid and shun the values and pursuits of this world. Some of you might know these verses by heart as well. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is what? Passing away. And all the desires and passions of the world with it. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. R.C. Sproul says, The behavior of fallen people should never become the standard of right and wrong for those who have been raised from the dead. A big problem in the church today is that even after people are converted to Christ, some still take their marching orders from what is acceptable and expected in the culture. And we must remember that we do not belong to this culture. Rather, as Paul concluded in his beseeching of Romans, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the best way to get a new mind or to have your mind transformed, and the Greek word there is metamorphosis, which is what happens to a caterpillar into a butterfly. What a contrast, isn't it? The caterpillar that looks, well, some people might think they look beautiful, but they, they, they have a different look. And from that look into being a, a butterfly is a metamorphosis. And the scripture says that we need to have a change like that in our mindset, in our understanding of what God's word is and what God's way is. And the best way to get a new mind is not by paying attention to the latest polls. It's not by spending our time watching the secular newscasts every day. It's not by becoming an expert on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Parler or whatever else is out there. It's by paying attention to the mind of Christ and the word of God. 
and so that we begin more and more to think and understand like Jesus. Colossians 3.16 said, let the word of Christ, what? Dwell in you richly. I, love, I just love the sound of that word. Not, not richly, but, well, that, that idea too. But just, just the sound of that, make it at home in your life. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And, for, and, and Paul tells us now that we've been saved that we, we have the mind of Christ because, the, because we have the spirit of Christ living within us. So no matter what anyone else says or thinks or does or approves, and this would be in correspondence to Psalm 1.1, if Jesus doesn't agree, then we shouldn't agree either. If Jesus wouldn't do it, we can't either. It's as simple as that. We are citizens of heaven, and our lives are supposed to demonstrate that we do not take our cues from this world, but from heaven itself. We're sojourners. We're aliens. And then Peter says, secondly, he says, you are in a conflict for your soul. We're in a conflict for the destiny of our soul. Not that we're going to lose our salvation, not that we're going to end up in another place besides heaven because we have accepted Christ. That's the reality. Once saved, always saved. But there's a conflict over our soul. Human passions wage war against your soul. So Peter uses the word abstain. And it's an imperative, it's a command, and it's, so it's something that he expects us to do. We can do it. Peter tells his readers to abstain first of all because they have a new and true identity in Christ our pull to who we are in Christ should be like the 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 gravity pull of the moon to the to the earth or the earth to the moon they have a gravity pull and so the moon stays in its place because it's in line with the gravity of the earth we need to keep in line because our gravity pull is from the son of God and the word of God and the new spirit within us that keep us in line as Christians, we have a new life. It's abundant and free. <clears throat> and we used to grow up singing this song, New Life in Christ. Abundant and free. What glories shine, what joys are mine, what wondrous blessings I see. My past, with its sin, the searching and strife, forever gone, there's a bright new dawn. For in Christ I have found, what? New life. And yet we know that we also have this, within this new life, an old life, an unredeemed life, still battling for us, battling with us in the flesh. So when struggles and temptations come, that shouldn't surprise us. When distress or something comes into our life to discourage us or alarm us, it's not like we've lost our salvation or somehow God has turned against us. It's because we have a battle going on for our soul within us. The reality of this spiritual battle is that we are no longer bound to obey its lusts or its desires or its pull. Rather, the victory in us is now possible through the spirit that lives within us. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know that we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats evil in this world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There is a battle. It's going on in our souls, but we can be victorious. So John and Peter and Paul encourage us over and over again that we have the ability through the indwelling spirit of God because of our relationship of salvation with Jesus Christ to be victorious in the battle over sin. But we still battle. Don't we? Anybody here not understand what I'm saying there? We have a battle. We have a fight every day and in every way and in so many ways we have to battle sin. Are you tempted to lie? Don't. Tell the truth. Obey the Lord and let him take care of the consequences. Are you tempted to be unfaithful to your wife or to your husband? Don't. Stay faithful. Do what you know is right and watch the Lord bless your marriage. Are you tempted to steal or to cheat on your taxes? That's coming up soon. This is very timely. All right. Don't. Pay unto Trudeau, I mean, pay unto Caesar what is due him and what is due to God give to him. And, let, and, and be reminded that the Lord is the one who has promised to provide all your need. Do not pray for easier lives. Pray to be stronger people. 
Do not seek the easy way out, but ask for divine insight to find the right way through. Don't whine and get angry and pout. Instead, pray and abstain from indulging the passions of the flesh. You know how sometimes you get discouraged and you just want to eat. eat. You just want to binge on something. And you, maybe some people want to drink and they want to, uh, drugs and whatever. Don't do that. Don't feed the passions that we're supposed to abstain from. Don't be discouraged, despondent, or depressed, but instead delight in the Lord and watch him work out his will in your life. And people would say, well, that's really easy to say. Well, it, it kind of was, but that's not the point. It's not just easy to say, but we can follow through on that because of what Paul wrote again in Romans chapter 6. So you also ought to consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 11 through 14. I don't know how many times I've reminded myself of situations that I'm in where I'm struggling of this principle in these verses. Romans 6, 11 through 14. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to the sinful desires. Instead, Paul says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to sin. That's a choice that we have to make. Instead, he says, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your new life as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God, because, verse 14, sin is no longer your master. If we choose to sin, it's because we have chosen to go back under something that has been defeated and something over which we can have victory. For you no longer live, Paul goes on, under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of grace. So abstain and refrain from fulfilling the lusts and passions of the flesh. Don't allow them to retake control of your life. And he says that in verse 11. It's not just sexual in nature when we talk about the passions of the flesh, but all kinds of evil in our fallen sinful humanity. Paul says in Galatians 5, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. But also he goes on to say idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like this. These are all things that characterize our old life. So to abstain from fleshly lusts is to abstain from the desires of the world, and rather we need to obey the new desires that God has given to us. Our fleshly passions are like warriors on a seek and destroy mission. They're not just after your body, they're after your soul. That puts you into a place that God cannot bless you. It's the wrestling match that we go through every day. And there are disastrous consequences for those who lose this battle. So we must remain constant and vigil because we have an internal enemy who is seeking once again to regain control of territory that's been lost. Does that make sense from a military perspective? It makes sense from a spiritual perspective. And it's a struggle that Paul found himself in on a, on a regular basis. You read his testimony. We don't have time this morning in, in Romans 7. But we all understand the basic concepts when Paul says, you know, I wanted to do what was right, but I ended up doing what was wrong. I struggle to do what is right. I want to do what, I, I struggle to do what is right. I, I want to do what is right, but I, I can't seem to always do it. Woe is me. And Paul wrestled with what we wrestle with every day. And Peter is saying it's the issue of the battle for the soul that's going on within every one of us. R.C. Sproul wrote of his own experience. He says, I get, I get a bit impatient. R.C. is with the Lord right now, so there's no more impatience. But I get a little impatient when I hear the television preachers say, come to Jesus and all your troubles will be over. He says, my life didn't get complicated until I became a Christian. Before I was a Christian, I did whatever I wanted. I went along with the group and the world, and when I became a Christian, I knew the war between flesh and spirit in a new way. Satan has declared war in our souls, he writes, and we are engaged every day in a spiritual battle to maintain our integrity, maintain our integrity and our obedience to Christ. So what things war against your soul? Where's the battle going on in your life today? Are you struggling with the integrity at work and in your relationships? Do you compromise your beliefs and standards in order to save face and to protect your reputation? Do you do what you have to do to get what you want in your own way, at work or life or with other people, even in your marriage? 
Are you wrestling with particular thoughts this morning or desires or fantasies or dreams that pull your spirit down to the gutter every day? Are you in a constant battle over drink or drugs or sex or lust of money? Do you struggle with your inability to forgive or to reconcile with other people? Do you feel your heart has too much anger in it? Are you finding it hard to obey the law? I struggled with that when this COVID thing started off. Still do a bit. Are you able to recognize when your mind is too focused on things below and not above and that you're having trouble sleeping because you're not resting in the Lord? The Bible's very clear. God has designed us all as unique individuals. So there's a unique battle within all of us. We all face similar temptations and trials, times of discouragement. But for you, it's unique. And for me, it's unique. My struggle might be different than yours. And your struggle might be different than mine, but one, one is not to compare one's struggle with someone else. Each of us comes to this battle against our soul from a different background. We all have different scars from previous entanglements. We all have different ingrained habits and particular bents towards which we need to struggle with and overcome and be victorious. Yet it is important for us to acknowledge as severe as our battles are to us, our neighbors are battling with something just as severe to them. Would that be true? Yeah. Sometimes we think the whole world revolves around us. Remember, I, I, I've said it before and I, I've been told it before that some of these lessons that, you know, that kind of thing that the world revol revolves around me should have been overcome in kindergarten. It, it doesn't. And yet we're tempted to believe that we have greater problems than anyone else. Galatians chapter 6, and I wish I had more time this morning to, to delve into this passage, but just very briefly, Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. But then in Galatians chapter 6 verse 5, three verses later, Paul writes, For each of you shall bear your own load. There's a difference between the burdens of chapter 2 and the load of chapter 5, or verse 5. Verse 5 says there are certain things that God has given to us as responsibilities, personal responsibilities in life. It's up to me to provide for my family, so I work. It's up to, per, up to me to overcome the difficulties in my life, so I pursue and I, and, I, and I fight and I battle. But sometimes there are things that come into our life where verse 2 makes more sense, and they become overwhelming. You ever been in a situation in life where you know, I can't handle this on my own. I need help. And I think Paul and Peter are saying what we need to recognize is that in those personal battles, we have a personal responsibility to fight and win. Sometimes we struggle with things in our mind. Other people can't get in there, so to speak, and help us. We have to make choices. We have to make decisions. We have to do what we know is right. But when other situations and other trials and troubles and persecutions in life come at us and it's more than we can bear from the outside or from internally, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a financial need, whether it's a, a, a physical accident that's happened on the outside, Paul says there are certain times when we need to rally around each other and carry the load together. When the weights and cares of the world and the enemies become overwhelming, it's time for others in the body of Christ to gather around and fight together in order to win the battle. And it doesn't mean we do it for the rest of our lives, but there are certain occasions and certain times and when we need to do that for each other. And Paul, notice that Paul, or Peter uses the phrase waging war. It's, it's a strong military term that carries with it the idea of a long-term military campaign. The passions of the flesh are relentless in their opposition to our soul. The passions in our flesh don't give up. They're in it for the long haul. And so therefore we need to recognize this is not something that's going to go away overnight, but it can be overcome. And how do we do that? Well, Paul goes on in verse 12 to say, not only in verse 11 do we need to abstain from the passions of life, but secondly, we need to focus on living an, an, an honorable life. A godly life. If our focus, somebody said, was simply on doing what God told us to do, we wouldn't have time to do the things that God told us not to do. So we need to focus on an honorable life. Verse 12 says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Keep your behavior and your conduct day by day by day honorable. It's a word that means excellent. 
beautiful in outward appearance. It means lovely, fine, winsome, gracious, fair to look at, and noble. Peter's encouraging readers to say, you know what God has done on the inside. Now let it out. Demonstrate the reality of your belief and who you are in Christ now on the outside. It's a kind of show and tell about what God has done inside. Transformed on the inside is most important to be transformed in your heart. But a visible testimony on the outside is not to be seen as insignificant. Some people focus so much on the inside that they forget they have an outside. Spiritually speaking. We're not to, be, we're not to live to be seen by men. We, we know that if we live our lives just to gain their applause and approval, then we have our reward. But we are supposed to live to be seen because whether we like it or not, we are a visual aid in helping them understand the power of God to change a soul. If the early Christians, as Peter's readers were, were to the early Christians, as Peter's readers were, to were to witness effectively among the Gentiles of their day, it was essential that they live their lives beyond reproach, above the bar that the culture set, which was very low. And the same truth applies for us today, of course. It's part of our living in line with our high calling. So what is an honorable life? If we had more time, we'd spend more time, but we don't. It's basically a life full of good works, good deeds. That's what he says in verse 12. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And sometimes Christians are known more for what we don't do, right? Oh, you don't do this. Oh, you don't say that. Oh, you don't live like that. And that's what our, that's what our testimony is. And I think Peter is trying to give us another emphasis. He says, let, let, your, let yourself be known as someone who does what is good, who says what is good, who thinks what is good. Be a positive in our approach rather than the negative. He's saying to be, we are to be people who are busy, whose lives are filled with good, not just abstaining from, but doing good. Not just the things that we make ourselves feel good doing, but Ephesians 2.10 says, make your life full of the things that God has designed you to do. His good works. Not just, a busy, not just busy with things that take up our time, but busy with the things that God says are, are good. Titus 2.7, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Titus 2.14, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Titus 3.8, the saying is trustworthy and I want you, I want you to insist on these things, uh, Paul writing to Titus, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works because these things are excellent and profitable for people. Well, what clues does First Peter give us about what forms our understanding of good works? And, and again, we're limited in time, but First Peter 1.15 says, As he has called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct. So holy conduct is a good work. First Peter 2.15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Well, in that context, being subject to every human institution and those who are in authority over us, is a good work. Titus 2 says we need to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient and ready for every good work. There's the golden rule. It's not that those who have the gold make the rules, but the golden rule is Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 that whatsoever you wish for others to do to you, do also to them for this is the law and the prophets. And yet that greater text of Matthew 6, 5 verse 16, Peter learned from the Lord and he says do it for the glory of of God. Let people see in your life your good deeds that they may glorify the Lord. So Peter says that believers must live true to the word of God and live in such a way and do good works that demonstrate the opposite of the accusations that were being hurled against us, both them in the first century and us today. If we're accused of being truthful, do the good work and tell the truth. If you're accused of being disobedient to authorities, then live in obedience to those who are over you. Our life must be one of kindness, not connivingness. We must be patient and forgiving, not impatient and unforgiving. We must do the good works of being faithful to the Lord and faithful to his word. We must strive to live honorable lives so that in the day of visitation when the Lord comes back, our good works will be seen for what they are and glory will be given 
to God. <clears throat> Peter uses the expression, the day of vi uh, visitation, in reference to the day when Christ will come back so that our good works will be seen in truth for what they are. And finally, as we come to a close, R.C. Sproul says, in the New Testament, the word visit, and I didn't know this, the word visit is formed from the root of the word bishop. The concept of the bishop in the New Testament is that of a visitor. It comes from the Greek military community where from time to time the general would drop in unannounced and review the troops. If the troops were battle ready, they received the praise of the general. If the troops were ill prepared, they would receive the judgment of the general. The metaphor is used to describe the day of visitation, the day when our heavenly bishop comes. And Sproul says, when he arrives, what will he find? When he arrives, what will he find us doing? Well, we must live honorable lives. We must abstain from fleshly lusts. One author said the world is a playground of passions, but the believer must be, must be reminded that the world is a battlefield of opposition and temptation, and we need, need to learn to say no. We must live a life full of good deeds. We need to adhere to what is good. And thirdly, we must never forget that we are being watched. Now, that, that could be a real problem with those who are a little paranoid of you know, being watched, but we are. The world is watching the church. They long for what the church has. They sometimes don't know it, but they're ready to pounce on it when we don't live up to our standards and when our good deeds aren't enough. But we are watched. We are being watched. <clears throat> Ask yourself, when I get outside of my circle of Christian friends and family, do I let my hair down and lower my standards? Or do I maintain my Christian convictions even in the world? Abstain? Adhere. Live an honorable life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the strong words of this passage. Short passage, but strong. Help us, Father, to abstain from the passions that are in our flesh that war against our soul. And to help us to adhere to doing the good works that you have prepared for us to do. Forgive us, Lord, for feeding too long our passions when we need to be starving them and pursuing the things that please you. I pray, Father, that you would give us the strength and the wisdom and the insight and the discernment to abstain from what is wrong, to adhere to what is good, all for the glory of God. For we pray it in Jesus' name.